Okay, so I think we can begin now, almost on time. So uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Jonathan Baugh to this edition of the RRI Quantum Science and Technology uh, webinar series. Uh, Jonathan, of course, uh, you know, is a prolific researcher in the field of quantum information and various other related areas. I'll do a short uh, introduction here, uh, the formal bit of this whole thing. So uh, Jonathan uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. Uh, his research group investigates the potential of semiconductor nanoelectronics for scalable quantum information processing. Uh, uh, he did his PhD in physics in 2001 uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and did seminal work on nuclear magnetism in quantum dots uh, during his postdoctoral studies at the University of Tokyo. Uh, Jonathan joined IQC as a faculty member in 2007 uh, he has published 70 research papers across many subfields, including magnetic resonance, quantum control, quantum transport, quantum dots, nanowires, proximity, superconductivity, nanomechanics, and material science. So, um, of course, on a personal note, I, I think I have also known Jonathan since 2007, and I had uh, the good fortune of also working with him on some of these early ideas on nanowires and um, uh, it is, of course, very nice to see you again here, Jonathan, although it would be better if you come and visit us at some point in the near future. But for now, let us, uh, you know, uh, make do with the webinar. So welcome uh, once again. And the title of your talk is uh, Single Electron Devices, Applications to Quantum Information. So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks. <laughs> great. Thanks, Urbashi. You know, thanks again for the invitation. It's great to see you uh, again. And uh, yeah, I would love to to visit some at some point in the in the hopefully not too distant future. <laughs> never never been to India, so you know that's definitely on my on my list. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, uh, so please, uh, yeah, it's yeah your pointer is there, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So now, um, so yeah. So th thanks for the introduction, and um, so I'd like to tell you about two different topics today. So I'm the talk is split into two parts. Um, the first part is on uh, devices that we're making with undoped Gallimard Snide, which is a fairly uh, unique platform. Only a few other groups have worked on it. So I'll describe how it works and how we can realize lateral PN junctions, single electron pumps, and ideally put these two things together to form a novel type of photonic source. Um, the second part is going to be on the effort to build a quantum computer in silicon, where ultimately you'd like to leverage the maturity of the um, silicon CMOS industry. So I'll talk about our particular approach to scaling up based on a network of nodes architecture. And I'll touch on the idea of electron shuttling uh, and discuss also um, error threshold estimates that we've made for this model. Um, I'll briefly talk about our experimental work in this direction as well, though in the interest of time, that, that might be a bit short. So Jonathan, just a quick question. I forgot to ask this. So do sure. you, uh, are you okay with questions during the uh, talk or do you want them all in the end? Um, I mean, I guess I'm okay either way, but maybe better, a little bit better to save it for the end. Just, sure. just so that- Unless it's really, really pressing, right? Yeah. Unless okay. it's really urgent. Yeah, maybe yeah. better to save it for the end just uh, so that I can get through everything. Sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so- so I'll start off with talking about the idea of the lateral quantum dot and the two-dimensional electron gas, because that plays a really important role in the, in the whole talk. And, and some of you may not be uh, so familiar with this. Uh, if you are, then apologies and <laughs> for, the, um, for the introduction to that. So a quantum dot, of course, is a zero-dimensional object, a very tiny sort of conducting island where we can confine charge carriers. Of course, at this scale, uh, quantum effects dominate. We can't simply treat it as a classical charge distribution. And we know that there'll be an integer number of electrons or holes on the dot. Uh, before, before we can form a lateral dot, however, we first need a two-dimensional electron gas, or 2 dag for short. Um, a very well-known type of 2 dag is formed at the interface of gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. Um, so, so to make a stack of materials like that, you would grow it with molecular beam epitaxy layer by layer. So um, when you incorporate a layer of dopant atoms in the heterostructure, um, the dopants donate electrons and the electrons will naturally accumulate where the potential energy is lowest. 
So here in this sort of side view, you can see these pluses represent the dopants. So now if we plot the potential energy as we move down vertically through the heterostructure, we'll find that there's a quasi-triangular quantum well that forms at the interface between uh, the gas and algas layers. So electrons accumulate there, and this gives a sheet of electrons only about five nanometers thick. So that's our two deg. Now to form a dot, we need to further confine the carriers within the plane, and that can be done electrostatically by placing metal electrodes on the surface. So we call these gate electrodes. And so here's just sort of a cartoon picture of placing gate electrodes on the top surface. Now by applying voltages to these gates, we can shape the underlying potential energy landscape, and we can make it unfavorable for electrons to be in certain locations by raising the potential energy above the Fermi energy in those areas. So with a suitable lateral layout of gates, we can form one of these quantum dot islands and have the quantum dot be tunnel coupled to electron reservoirs on either side. So we could actually measure current tunneling through the dot. Now, um, if you recall, the density of electronic states as a function of energy has a different form for conductors in different dimension, right? So in 3D, it goes as the square root of energy and 2D, it's a constant, but you generally have multiple subbands. So you see this sort of staircase um, in 1D, it goes as one over square root of E and in zero dimensions uh, that corresponds to a quantum dot, only discrete energy levels are allowed. Okay, so that's a key thing uh, to remember. Now the spacing between these levels and a quantum dot is, is due to two things. One, the energy of Coulomb repulsion between electrons and two, the quantum mechanical orbital energies. So like the particle in the box, you know, energy spectrum. So now if we look at the energy diagram uh, for a generic single quantum dot connected to left and right electron reservoirs, it would look like this picture here at the lower right. So electrons fill a continuum of levels in the leads up to some chemical potential, call it mu L for the left and mu R for the right. Um, so now electrons can tunnel on or off discrete levels in the dot as long as these levels fall between uh, mu L and mu R. So in the dot, um, levels below the chemical potential <clears throat> are filled just like they are in atoms with two electrons of opposite spin. So um, I should also say that experiments on this kind of quantum dot can only be done at very low temperatures, right? And that's because at high temperature, uh, you have a Fermi distribution describing the states in the leads, and that gets smeared out uh, so much at high temperature that you can't distinguish individual levels in the dot by measuring transport from left to right. So we need to be at low enough temperature so that the level spacing is larger than KT. Now, since the energy level spacing is on the order of milli electron volts, <clears throat> that means that we typically need temperatures below one Kelvin. And so, you know, our experiments are typically carried out in a helium three cryostat or in a dilution refrigerator. Okay, so that just sort of sets kind of the context for this. Now, um, we might ask an interesting question, what would happen if we remove the dopant atoms from the heterostructure? So at first, this might seem like a bit of a silly idea because then you wouldn't have electrons to populate the two deg and you wouldn't have this square well potential, or sorry, you wouldn't have this triangular potential forming uh, anyway. Um, but it turns out that we can still form a two deg, but we just need two things. One, we need a global top gate that's gonna, that can provide an electric field that can be tuned to make a confining potential at the gas L gas uh, interface. And two, we need recessed metal uh, ohmic contacts to the two deg. In other words, like a side contact to the two dimensional electron gas. Uh, conventional ohmic contacts won't work because the top gate uh, would be sc would screen um, would be screened sorry by the metal at the surface so you'd get a discontinuity in the two deg and that wouldn't work um, so the research you have to have recessed omits that have this particular sort of slanted profile and that forms when the metal diffuses laterally into the heterostructure okay so to obtain really good high quality ohmic contacts in this configuration uh, is tricky. And uh, it's a lot trickier than it is for the standard modulation dope samples. Uh, so it took us a couple of years to really perfect this, but the effort is worthwhile uh, because we gained some clear advantages over the standard uh, doped material. So the first advantage is uh, 
that you can obtain higher uh, carrier mobilities. So better electron and hole mobility and also uh, better reproducibility. So here's a comparison of the electron mobility uh, measured in an experiment versus density for two heterostructures that are nominally the same, except that one is doped and one is undoped. So the mobilities, I should point out that the mobilities in the uh, conventional doped heterostructure uh, are already very high to begin with. So a mobility of several million is not uncommon. And this is because the interfaces are very high quality and the dopants are spatially separated from the two deg, uh, which reduces scattering uh, compared to um, a uniformly doped semiconductor. So that's why these are referred to as uh, high electron mobility transistors or hemped structures. Um, however, if we remove the doping, the mobility, uh, we can see that the mobility is actually higher, uh, particularly in the regime where carrier density is relatively low. Okay, this is not that surprising since the dopant atoms uh, act as ionized defects and are a dominant source of electron scattering. So removing the dopants decreases scattering. Now at high carrier densities, electrons in the two deg screen each other from the ionized impurities uh, potential. So in that regime, we don't see much difference uh, between the doped and undoped um, materials. So the lack of dopants also tends to make devices more stable and reproducible from cool down to cool down. Um, so the dopants and, and, and crystal defects are a source of charge fluctuations, uh, which typically have something like a one over F noise spectrum. And so in any one cool down of a device, a random charge configuration is usually frozen in. Okay, but without the dopants, these charge fluctuations are, are much more suppressed. Now, the second important advantage of the undoped heterostructure is that now we're not limited to just electrons or just holes, but we can, we can do both in the same system. Um, so by applying negative top gate voltage, uh, we can, instead of a positive one, we can induce a hole gas. Now, technically, there's a bit of a challenge because the ohmic contacts for holes uh, must be made with a different metal material than uh, for the um, electrons. Um, we use gold beryllium for the hole contacts or the p-type contacts. But otherwise, it's really just as simple as changing the top gate voltage to get electrons, like an n-type semiconductor, or holes, a p-type semiconductor. So the nice thing is we can truly make ambipolar devices, which opens the doors to a lot of exciting things. And I'll talk a little, you know, and then and, and that's I'll talk a little bit about that today. Okay, so so one of the things that we can make is, for example, a lateral PN junction. And so here's an example of one that, that we fabricated. Um, this is an optical image of a device that we fabricated here at Waterloo. So in gold, you can see the top gates on the left and the right, and they overlap with both N and P type uh, ohmic contacts so that both sides of the device can be either N or P. So therefore we can have, we can make any combination that we like. You could have NN, PN, NP, or PP uh, configurations. Um, the inset here shows that near the junction gap, the top gate is a very thin titanium, only about five nanometers thick. And so, we designed it that way so that it would be transparent to electroluminescence so that we can collect uh, electroluminescence signals. Um, so if we put a sufficiently negative top gate voltage on the left side, for example, that'll induce a 2D hole gas. A positive voltage on the right side will induce a 2D electron gas. This would give a PN diode. In order to overcome the barrier and get current through the diode, we need to apply a bias voltage uh, of the correct polarity, it's approximately equal to the band gap of gallium arsenide, which is one, about 1 1.5 electron volts. Now, in the same device, we could switch polarities and, and, and form an NP junction. And in that case, we'd have to reverse the polarity of the bias in order to get uh, a current through the diode. Okay, and so here we can see uh, experimentally uh, this bidirectional diode behavior. So the, the green curves uh, here show the IV behavior of the PN diode. So notice that the current on the left side of the screen, uh, or the, the green curve on the left side of the screen is zero everywhere at negative bias. It only turns on at positive bias, as it should. Uh, the solid green curve has a sharp turn on around 1.5 volts, as we would expect. However, um, upon subsequent traces, we obtain the dashed green curve. Um, and we attribute this to a change in state of the device 
probably due to charge accumulation um, uh, so somewhere in the device. This is something that we're still trying to understand fully. Um, but we can switch the polarity of the device and obtain the red curves here. And so you can see that's quite symmetric. Um, the first trace and subsequent trace of traces uh, sort of behave the same way, but just opposite polarity. Okay. Um, now, because of this sort of charge buildup and this, um, uh, not, not only does it change the IV characteristics, but it also suppresses uh, electroluminescence. Uh, and so what we've and, and and so what we used to do in the beginning was just uh, we'd have to warm this device up to room temperature and cool it down again and then do a measurement, but then the measurement wouldn't last very long because the the um, the the state state of the device would change. Uh, so what we found um, a way to solve this is to operate the uh, diode in an AC driven mode. And what I mean by that is alternating the top gate potentials so that you actually alternate between PN and NP configurations. So if you just leave the bias voltage fixed, say at positive 1.5 volts, then you only get current during the PN portion of the cycle. And the NP portion of the cycle sort of um, decreases the charge accumulation and, and sort of resets the device. Okay, so we also call this sort of the set reset mode of operation. Um, so we can see that in this plot here. Um, so this is the set reset mode. We're actually switching the top gates you know, plus or minus five volts uh, in an AC sort of mode. Um, and uh, so every half cycle, we get a current in the forward direction. And uh, so you can see that here. Um, the current is slightly noisy, and that's partly just due to the way that we did the measurement. Um, but in fact, we find that this AC driving technique actually stabilizes the devices for electroluminescence experiments. Um, because as I say, it um, sort of resets this um, charge buildup. Okay, so uh, the data that we show here is for a slow AC frequency less than one hertz, but we have been able to do this up to roughly one kilohertz frequency. So we're actually driving this, uh, you know, oscillating tape top gate voltages up to a kilohertz and, and, and it works. Um, so, you know, I'm not personally an optics expert. I, I tend to focus more on transport, but um, in this project, I have a collaborator uh, Michael Reimer, who has a photonics lab with an optical cryostat. And so together with um, him and, and his postdoc, uh, Lin Tian, uh, we've collected electro a lot of electroluminescence data from these devices using this um, set reset technique. So um, here's some examples. Uh, so emission, light emission is observed around 820 nanometers, which corresponds to the band gap of gallium arsenide. Now, before going further, I need to mention that there are two types of heterostructure that we've used. The first is what I've already introduced, where you have a single gas algas interface, and we call that a single hetero interface. The other type is a quantum well heterostructure, where you actually have a thin layer of gas that's sandwiched between two layers of aluminum gallium arsenide. Now, in a quantum well heterostructure, electrons and holes are always confined in the quantum well. So it's natural to expect that when we force electrons and holes together in a PN junction, we're gonna form excitons. And, and some of those excitons at least will radiatively recombine and emit light. Um, however, this is not uh, obvious for the single header interface because in the area between the PN and regions in the gap between the top gates, uh, neither electrons nor holes are actually confined to 2D at all. Uh, nonetheless, in those single hetero interface uh, devices, we still observe electroluminescence. Okay, and so this might be because the carrier mobilities are very high in this material. And so even without confinement, um, you still get um, a lots of uh, exciton formation because of just the ballistic nature of carrier transport. Okay, so um, here what uh, we're plotting is the EL electroluminescence uh, spectrum in a quantum well uh, sample as a function of the PN bias voltage. So we can see that there's a sharp turn on of the EL at around 1.52 uh, volts, which is you know, effectively the band gap of, of gallium arsenide. So um, a little bit later, I'll, I'll identify this uh, narrow higher energy peak with the neutral exciton. Now in, in this panel C, you can see that the line shape does not depend on the device polarity. It's the same whether we operate as a PN or NP junction. Okay, and then in this panel D, we're plotting the 
electroluminescence intensity is a function of the AC driving frequency. And so what we can see is that the, uh, the intensity actually increases with the driving frequency. And, and the reason for that is because, like I said, in, if you just operate in DC mode, the light emission decays with time sort of exponentially. And by doing this set reset at higher frequency, we interrupt this decay more effectively. And so you get a, a larger um, signal. Okay, and um, <clears throat> the other remarkable observation from these samples is that the emission spectrum is typically quite narrow. So here we see um, the emission dominated by a single peak that we ascribe to the neutral exciton, and the line width is about one millielectron volt. Uh, this particular device had a three micron gap between the top gates. So when we zoom in, um, we see more complexity in the spectra. Uh, we can typically fit these spectra with several overlapping peaks, uh, some of which probably correspond to charged excitons, uh, as, I'll, as I'll mention in a moment. Um, the details can vary a lot between different samples, different voltage conditions, um, where exa exactly on the sample the light's coming from, and, and so forth. So identifying these peaks is still an area uh, that we're you know, researching. Um, now, the narrowest neutral exciton peak that we've observed was only about 0.4 milli electron volts in width. Uh, which we think may be one of the narrowest um, in the literature. And so we believe that the high quality of the heterostructure material and the lack of dopants is, is part of the reason for this uh, really narrow EL spectrum. Uh, here we show the uh, temperature dependent uh, electroluminescence measured on a quantum well sample. Um, based on the temperature dependence, we can assign the lower energy peak, uh, sort of the shoulder to the left, uh, to the uh, negatively charged trion X minus uh, state. So that peak disappears with temperature uh, faster than the neutral exciton peak. Uh, the neutral exciton peak actually survives up to about 85 Kelvin. Now, uh, by fitting the peak ratio to an activation energy law, we can obtain a trion dissociation energy of about 1.8 milli electron volts. And, and that's sort of consistent with what we would expect from uh, photoluminescence studies and, and of excitons and quantum wells. Um, now, interestingly, we can also see a, a higher energy peak uh, that we've labeled uh, LH here. Um, and so that LH stands for light hole. So we this peak is about six and a half milli electron volts above the neutral exciton energy. And uh, we believe that represents an exciton that's formed by an electron in a light hole. And as you increase temperature, you drive more holes from the heavy hole band into the light hole band just thermally. And so this peak becomes more prominent as you go to higher temperature. Okay, so it might be something interesting for, for future research um, looking at the uh, light holes as opposed to the, the heavy holes, which are typically the ground state. Okay, um, and then just one other interesting piece. Uh, in some experiments, we actually observed uh, two well-separated peaks which we tentatively label as X naught and X minus. Um, <clears throat> the X minus <clears throat> is at the lower energy uh, or longer wavelength, and that's due to the binding energy of the additional electron. <clears throat> so interestingly, we can actually influence the spectrum based on the uh, carrier densities in the N and P regions in some samples. Um, so if we make the top gate voltages asymmetric so that there's a higher hole density compared to electrons, we can almost remove the charged exciton peak, as we show here in the middle. On the other hand, if we have a higher electron density compared to holes, uh, we can enhance the X minus peak and nearly remove the uh, neutral exciton peak. Okay, so this is still somewhat a tentative uh, result, uh, but it could be a really interesting feature if it's something that we can control uh, reliably. Okay, so, um, now, what we'd like to do uh, in, in this material system is to controllably inject a single electron into a p-n junction uh, so that it's likely to radi radiatively recombine with a hole and emit a photon, right? So we want to um, engineer a single electron uh, source. And so a, a device that can be a source of single electrons has already been developed for you know, a couple of decades 
in the, this type of material system, and that's called a single electron pump, right? So the idea is to form a dynamic quantum dot. And here I'm sort of schematically uh, representing the 1D potential that's sort of a cross section of the dot potential. Um, now this is a dynamic potential because at least one of the gate voltages controlling, uh, controlling it is being driven at high frequency. So hundreds of megahertz up to around one gigahertz. Okay, so we can, we can sort of visualize this cycle in, in, in four uh, parts. Uh, the first step is loading in which the tunnel barrier to the left side of the dot is lowered. So electrons are scooped up from the left re reservoir into the dot. And the second step, the left tunnel barrier is increased. And during this process, some electrons tunnel back to the left reservoir. Okay, and the third step, uh, you have a strongly confined, uh, oh, sorry, third step is here. Uh, you have a strongly confined um, uh, dot that's formed with a small number of electrons in it. Okay, and then, and then in the last step of the cycle, uh, the left barrier is raised uh, enough that one or more electrons is kicked out uh, to the right side reservoir. So, of course, there are several variations on the idea of an electron pump or electron turnstile, but this one that I've presented here is conceptually the simplest, and it's called a one parameter pump, since only one tunnel barrier is being driven uh, dynamically. Okay, so this is actually the type of pump that we've realized uh, experimentally. So with the top gate, we induce a two deg everywhere in the green region in this diagram here. Um, and then you have a, subtle, a set of local uh, gate electrodes, uh, the ones that are kind of shown in gold. So these locally deplete the two deg. So you get a U-shaped, the, the, these U-shaped gold electrodes form a constriction, and then the vertical electrodes form the tunnel barriers. Okay, we call them entrance and exit gates. So you have an RF signal that's applied to the entrance gate along with a DC uh, voltage um, using a bias T. So you can see that the dynamic uh, dot is formed right in the center of this uh, square here. Okay, so the bottom and then the middle picture is sort of a, a side view cross section of the same device. Um, now the bottom is a scanning electron microscope picture of a pump device that we fabricated. Uh, note that you don't see the top gate here um, because this picture was taken before the uh, dielectric and top gate were, were deposited. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see these, uh, these local gates. All right, so, so when you make such a device and you tune it up properly, what you can get is quantized current through it. So if one electron is emitted per cycle, the current is simply E times F, where E is the electron charge, and F is the frequency of the RF signal applied to the entrance gate. Now, by tuning these barrier gates, <clears throat> we, you can, you can you know, go to a different plateau where you can emit two electrons per cycle or three electrons and so forth. So in general, if you have an ideal pump, uh, the current is quantized as N times E times F, where N is just an integer. Okay, so that's the idea of a, of a um, single electron pump. So here on the left side, um, we see an experimental pump map for that device that I just showed you, or one that's similar to it. Uh, so in color scale, we see the differential conductance. It's the derivative of the pump current with respect to the DC voltage on the entrance gate. So we vary the DC voltages on both the entrance gate and exit gates, and we get this map of conductance versus these two gate voltages. Now these bright lines uh, represent current steps and the dark blue represents a constant current or a plateau. So if we take a line cut sort of horizontally along this map uh, and we plot the current, it looks like this. We can see these clear uh, steps and, and plateaus. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, this middle plot is for an RF frequency of 500 megahertz. Uh, the one on the right is for a higher frequency, about 850 megahertz. Um, and note that the current on the first plateau matches this condition of um, the current being equal to E times, exactly E times F. Um, and so we can label that as the N equals one plateau, and then you get N equals two and N equals three and so forth. Um, you can see that the quantization is strongest for the N equals one plateaus and then decreases at higher plateaus because the charging energy of the dynamic dot tends to decrease as you move towards higher plateaus. 
Now, uh, we can actually fit this first plateau to a model called the universal decay cascade model, um, which is, you know, was developed to model these, um, these pumps. And uh, that's what these yellow curves that are superimposed here um, are, are showing, the sort of best fit to this uh, decay cascade model. So we can roughly um, estimate the error in pumped current by taking uh, one minus um, this uh, fit value at the inflection point of the first plateau. So this gives us an estimated error of about uh, 1.7 parts per million in the 500 megahertz uh, pump. So that would, what that would mean uh, is that, you know, out of a million cycles, uh, only an average of, of around two cycles would give you something other than exactly one electron. So such as zero or two electrons, for example. Okay, now we didn't actually measure that. That's just sort of an estimated error, but, um, but that sort of already puts these pumps kind of on par with um, some of the best ones in the literature. So uh, metrologists are interested in these uh, very high accuracy pumps because it's a, it's a possible route to a, to a better current standard uh, if these errors can be further reduced. Um, these sources can also be used uh, in you know, various types of single electron applications like single electron optics. And, um, and of course our interest would be for a single photon source. Uh, lastly, just to show you here, um, we can look at the temperature dependence of the electron pump, and, and this shows that we can, uh, we can observe uh, well-defined plateaus up to around 4 Kelvin and close to 1 gigahertz pump frequency. So this is just to say that we don't need dilution refrigerator temperatures in order to see you know, charge quantization from these pumps, and, and I think that's a good news for uh, practical applications like photon sources. Okay, so, so the idea that we're ultimately trying to pursue here is to, to combine this electron pump with the PN junction I showed you before and, um, and, uh, um, and, and, and realize a photon source uh, with that combination. So here's kind of a schematic uh, picture of what we're trying to do. Um, so you, you locate the pump on the inside of a PN junction and then in each RF cycle, uh, we can operate say on the first plateau inject a single electron into a sea of holes on the P side of the device. Um, and of course you have a bias that's very close to the, um, the threshold for current. And so you can drive the electrons and holes together <clears throat> and then hopefully you get radiated recombination and you can emit a single photon. Okay, so the idea would be to have a deterministic on-demand um, photon source. Um, now that, the neat thing in principle about this is that we're not limited to the first plateau. So we could vary the executive voltage, we could inject two electrons per cycle or three electrons per cycle. And you know, so if, if this radiative recombination were perfectly efficient, um, then this could translate into time correlated pairs on the N equals two plateau, uh, triplets on the N equals three plateau and so forth. Um, of course, you know, radiative process won't be 100% efficient, but Still, you know, this is something that we, we're eager to make and, and see what we can get. Um, so we expect to emit uh, single photons with the same narrow bandwidth that we obtained in the uh, electroluminescence experiments I showed earlier. Um, time correlated pairs, if we could achieve that, are very interesting because that could be a resource for quantum illumination, which is a set of methods for doing quantum ranging, detection and imaging at the single photon level. Um, and you can use either uh, time correlated or truly entangled uh, pairs for, for those applications. Okay, so, so we haven't actually made this device yet, but this is something that is in progress and hopefully we'll have some results from that soon. Um, and, and, and just to say that, you know, we're, we're actually not the first people to, to think about this concept. Um, an experiment was published in 2020 by uh, the group at Cambridge uh, however, instead of a single electron pump, they use surface acoustic waves to inject electrons into the PN junction in undoped gallium arsenide. And uh, they were actually able to demonstrate a single photon emission by uh, showing that the second order correlation function or the G2 uh, at t time equal to zero is less than a half, which is kind of the threshold for claiming that you have a single photon source. Um, now, surface acoustic waves are not as precise as pumps uh, and, um, and, and generally don't, don't always operate at this sort of single electron level. 
So, you know, overall, I think this bodes well for our approach. Um, so yeah, we'll hopefully get some results uh, to show on that soon. And uh, here's uh, just a couple of papers that are related uh, to this uh, work in case anybody is interested in further details. Okay. Um, let me move on to the second part of the talk. Um, I'm just looking at the time, so I'll have to speed up a little bit, but um, so the second part of the talk is gonna be on uh, quantum computing and, and silicon. So um, the idea here is that when it comes to quantum computing with um, spins in solid state, uh, three, five semiconductors like gallium arsenide have the issue that um, you cannot rid the lattice of nuclear spins uh, because all the isotopes in, in the three and five columns of the periodic table have nuclear spin. Uh, for silicon, a group four element, however, we can remove the 29 silicon nuclear spins and be left with a, a 28 silicon lattice, which is nuclear spin free. So this has been shown to greatly increase the coherence times of electron spins that are confined in quantum dots as qubits. So we can adapt the idea of the conventional MOSFET transistor and modify it a little bit so that it becomes a quantum dot at low temperatures. Um, so again, we can use gates on the surface to accumulate a two-dimensional electron gas. But now this two dag is at the uh, silicon, silicon dioxide interface and local fine gate electrodes uh, are used to define quantum dots. So the same kind of idea, but now in silicon rather than gallium arsenide. Now, an obvious advantage with silicon is that you can leverage the maturity of the existing CMOS industry and, um, and that you can also have co-integration of classical and quantum circuits um, even, on the same, even on the same die. Um, another thing is that the operating temperature of these qubits can be uh, pretty high relative to superconducting qubits, uh, which only work well below 100 millikelvin. So spin qubits in silicon have actually been shown to work up to around two Kelvin and in principle could work you know, at four Kelvin or higher. Um, the, the issue is really just the, the readout that becomes challenging at high temperature. The, the qubit and the, and the dot itself is, is fine. <laughs> so um, this higher temperature operation is what really opens the door to co-integration of classical control and readout circuits with the quantum circuits um, because the cooling power of a cryostat increases uh, very rapidly with base temperature. Right, so within a dilution refrigerator, you may only be able to handle microwatts of power, but you know, at, at two Kelvin or four Kelvin, you might be able to handle milliwatts to watts of power dissipation. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation. So the question we wanna ask is how do we go from the laboratory scale devices we have today? So this particular, uh, this is an SEM of a device that we actually fabricated here at Waterloo. How do we go from that, which is small scale, sort of like two dots uh, to you know, something that's truly large scale processor. Uh, for example, something based on the surface code for quantum error correction. Um, so we know that the scale of the problem and the overhead required is, is really staggering to build a large scale quantum computer. Um, you know, for example, to factor a 2000 bit RSA number, uh, Fowler et al uh, back in 2012 estimated that you would need around 100 million physical qubits in 27 hours of runtime based on superconducting qubits with 100 nanosecond uh, readout time scale. So even if we scale to more modest intermediate scales like hundreds or thousands of physical qubits, still quite challenging. Um, so people have you know, started to think about this and there've been some proposed architectures um, to directly map the surface code to a densely packed 2D array has some obvious challenges, right? The density of wiring interconnects is very high. Even with 3D integration, the conventional foundry processes can't reach that kind of interconnect density. And then you have the issue of crosstalk, you know, gates passively coupled to everything nearby, not just the dot they're intended to control. So this means that controlling, you know, the exchange coupling, um, of each qubit with four neighbors would be extremely challenging, okay? Because exchange is the method that you use for doing two qubit gates with spin qubits. And this exchange energy is actually an exponential function of the tunnel barrier. Uh, so that would make this extremely sensitive to uh, things like charge noise, uh, crosstalk, and, and control errors. 
Um, so more recent proposals improve on this in some respects, um, and they start to rely on moving qubits around by shuttling from dot to dot, uh, but they still in general aim for sort of dense 2D arrays. Um, now to sort of boil things down to a very simple picture, a dense 2D array of quantum dots is, is really hard. And that's because of the scale of a quantum dot, right? Which is like on the scale of hundred nanometers or even smaller. So you can certainly fabricate an array, but to achieve the level of control that you need for universal quantum computing is, is quite challenging, right? So that's hard. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at today's few qubit devices, uh, what people can generally do in the lab today is, is, is make and study 1D, one-dimensional arrays, right? That's a very common configuration. And more or less, we already know how to do that with enough control to demonstrate algorithms on two to three qubits, or maybe even four or five. So, you know, scaling to larger 1D ar arrays is very feasible. And uh, the problem is that error correction in 1D is very inefficient. Uh, so we really need a 2D code. So can we build a 2D surface code out of 1D quantum dot arrays? That's, that's the question. And um, so I'll propose that, that we can do that. And so the idea is based on uh, an approach that was first introduced by uh, Simon Benjamin's group at um, Oxford in the context of ion trap quantum computers. And this was thinking about how you might utilize many small processors that can somehow be coupled together um, uh, rather than building one very large ion trap. So the idea is that you can map the surface code to a network as long as you can share entanglement between neighboring nodes. So at the beginning of each surface code cycle, you would entangle two qubits between neighboring nodes, right? So in the case of ion traps, this could be done with a quantum optical link. Um, once you have that shared entanglement between neighboring nodes, everything else in the cycle is done locally. So there's a single data qubit in each node that holds the quantum information, and then two or three ancilla qubits, additional qubits that are used for carrying out the stabilizer operations and, and kind of get measured during the course of the surface code cycle. Now, in the original paper, uh, they also showed that rather large infidelities in the entanglement distribution up to around 10% could be tolerated. Um, but this comes at the expense of additional ancilla qubits and, and operations for entanglement purification. So anyway, we had the idea to map this to a spin qubit processor. Um, and I think a nice aspect of this idea is that you then sort of split the scaling problem into two parts, right? One is that you have to have the ability to carry out local operations on small nodes, but doing this uh, is something that, you know, we already kind of know how to do, uh, you know, as a community. And, um, and then the second piece is just the ability to distribute entanglement between nodes. So here's a kind of a cartoon of the, the network architecture as we envision it in a silicon processor. Um, so the nodes are these small linear arrays of uh, a few dots. Uh, the data qubit is shown here in green, just schematically. Um, I'm not showing the explicit electrodes that you would use to define the dots. This is just sort of a cartoon representation. So the quantum dots are initially filled by electrons that come from an ion implanted uh, reservoir uh, and they're brought to the nodes by an accumulation gate that's shown in orange here. Uh, the reservoirs don't actually need to take up this much space. This is just sort of a sketch. Now to distribute entanglement between nodes, the most straightforward way uh, to do that is to simply move electrons around. And this is referred to as uh, shuttling. And by that, we mean that you have a linear array of empty dots. Um, uh, and you can fill one dot at the end. And then by successively raising and lowering the, uh, the gate potentials, you can force tunneling events uh, from dot to dot. And you can push an electron through the array, uh, you know, uh, similar to how charges moved in a CCD array, for example. But here we're talking at the single electron level. Uh, we can elongate these gates somewhat to stretch out the shuttling quantum dots. And, and that's what we're representing here by these, um, these blue uh, structures. And so I've labeled that as the shuttle highway. So locally, um, all the dots are in a 1D array, 
but because of the ability to shuttle electrons, we can form an overall 2D array of connected nodes. And uh, we also have uh, made space in between the nodes for um, integrating, uh, you know, we could integrate uh, classical uh, transistor circuits for um, uh, control and readout purposes. So how do we get entanglement? I mean, you know, you can talk about moving electrons between different nodes, but how do we actually get entanglement between the spins? Well, in a way, we get that for free in quantum dots, right? So when you fill an atomic orbital with two electrons, they form a spin singlet, uh, which is a maximally entangled state of two spins. So it's the same thing with quantum dots, uh, because you can think of quantum dots as artificial atoms. You know, Pauli exclusion the principle still um, applies. So what we do is we load two electrons into the ground state orbital of a dot, and then we can separate the two spins spatially by adjusting the gates to favor the one-one charge configuration. All right, so going from here where you load two electrons in the same dot, you form a local singlet, and then you can separate them, and then you can continue to separate them uh, further. So for electrons in uh, silicon, um, the spin orbit interaction is, is pretty weak. And assuming that the nuclear spins have been removed, um, you know, we think there's a good chance that it may be possible to achieve coherent spin transport over uh, large distances, like sort of the scale of, of several microns. Okay, this is still an open question, whether or not we can preserve the spin coherence um, while shuttling. But as I say, in silicon, it's promising because the spin orbit interaction is weak. Okay. So um, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but um, just to say that the PETA group from Princeton uh, demonstrated single charge shuttling uh, back in 2019 over uh, across nine dots on a time scale of 50 nanoseconds. So or about five nanoseconds per shuttle. Um, and their ex experiment demonstrated that the charges could be moved uh, essentially 100% uh, deterministically. Uh, they didn't look at spin coherence in this uh, paper though. So I think uh, people are starting to look at that now. Now, um, let me talk a little bit about the, um, the surface code. Um, and how that works. So each uh, cycle of the surface code is called a stabilizer operation. Uh, and I can briefly walk you through how it works. Uh, so we focus on a subset of four nodes. Um, so first we would uh, load singlets and nodes A and C, and the entangled spins are shuttled to nodes uh, B and D, where they're stored as uh, ancilla qubits. And then this is again repeated with nodes A and C, and from there, um, we can form a GHZ state, which is a four qubit entangled state that spans all four nodes. Okay, so here by this third step, we formed a GHZ state, which is an entangled state linking all four nodes. So from that GHZ state um, and some additional operations within the nodes, uh, then we perform the stabilizer operation that's really the heart of the surface code. Okay, and um, so in our, if we you know, draw a circuit diagram for how that would work in our architecture, it would look like this. You would first have this uh, singlet, this distribution of electron singlet pairs between um, neighboring nodes. And then you'd have local operations and measurements which form the GHZ state. And then a further set of local operations and measurements that perform the uh, stabilizer operation. Okay, and, and the stabilizer operation, you're essentially doing a control knot gate between the data qubit and all of the ancilla qubits and then measuring the ancilla qubits. And that allows you to see whether or not an error has occurred on the data qubit without, uh, without directly perturbing that data qubit. Okay, and then here's just a little, uh, oh, I, I can't, can I play this animation? Oh yeah, so this is just a little animation that, um, uh, one of my students made to kind of illustrate how this would um, look in a kind of a cartoon sense. So first we distribute, we're distributing the electrons um, between nodes, we're uh, the singlet entangled um, electrons. And then, and then we focus on a single node and we carry out a, a set of local operations consisting of uh, arbitrary single qubit rotations, as well as uh, exchange uh, gates, which are two qubit gates. Okay, and so, um, so we've already formed the GHZ and here we're 
performing the operations for the uh, control Z operation or, or control not operation uh, for the stabilizer. And uh, it ends up by uh, measuring the second ancilla. And once you've done that, uh, if you detect no errors, then we know that the qubit, that particular data qubit is in the correct state. If you do uh, detect an error, then you have to use a maximum, like, uh, a maximum likelihood algorithm to sort of uh, estimate what the most likely error was and then and go in and correct it. Okay. Um, I, I'm running a little bit, I'm, I'm going a little bit slower than I had hoped. So uh, I'll sort of skip over a little bit of this. Um, we, we did some study on the surface code error thresholds for this architecture and, and sort of um, what we sort of came up with was that, uh, that um, as long as you could do shuttling um, to a fidelity better than about 99%, um, then you know you should th this uh, surface code uh, should work in practice. Okay, and then uh, just very briefly, um, you know we work on these uh, silicon dots experimentally in my lab as well. Um, of course, experiment is, has a long way to go to catch up with um, theory. <laughs> Um, but what we did here was we were just looking at whether we can simplify these devices by eliminating explicit tunnel gates. Um, so we have a, a device here where you have a, well, actually, sorry, let me go back. So this P is the plunger gate, which defines the quantum dot and L and R are the left and right uh, reservoirs. And normally you would have an additional gate between L and P and between P and R that would control tunneling, um, control the tunnel coupling uh, between the dot and the reservoir. But what we're showing in this paper is that just by designing the geometry correctly and by using voltages on the LNR gates, we can actually control the tunnel coupling over eight orders of magnitude. Um, and so that could simplify the device uh, um, devices considerably uh, in terms of their, uh, you know, having fewer gates uh, to worry about. Uh, so particularly for chart sensing and shuttling, what we're showing here is that you can make an array of dots without having explicit uh, tunnel gates, and you can control tunneling just by the voltages on these uh, these gates that we have. Okay, and then you know we we use these devices to do some magnetospectroscopy, and we can um, we can um, you know detect uh, so-called valley states and valley splitting, um, which is a feature of the um, conduction band um, landscape of silicon. Um, Okay, and so this is just an important part of the qubit characterization. And uh, then we showed that we can actually go to linear quantum dot arrays, um, you know, like a double dot shown here with the characteristic uh, pattern stability diagram and, and uh, we've made triple dots and, and so forth. And, and what we are aiming to do here is to really study this uh, um, coherent uh, spin shuttling um, and, and, and try and determine if that can be done uh, with high fidelity. And silicon. Okay, and uh, I don't, again, I don't have time to talk about it, but um, during the pandemic, particularly when we couldn't be in the lab, uh, we started um, uh, uh, a software uh, project to develop an open source um, simulator for this uh, silicon quantum dot system. And so this is something that uh, we're, my group is still developing, and uh, we have a couple of publications um, related to this, but um, we're still uh, developing this and, and hopefully making it um, available to the community soon. Okay, so um, sorry for running a little bit over time there, but um, just to summarize, um, I think both of these projects show that control at the single electron level is enabling new types of quantum technologies in, in a solid state. And uh, with undoped uh, gallium arsenide, uh, we, sh we actually demonstrated the first single electron pump in undoped gallium arsenide and um, controlled electroluminescence in lateral PN junctions. And um, what we're trying to do is combine these to form a single photon source. And with the silicon uh, uh, devices, um, we proposed a, a network architecture for the implementing the surface code scalably, um, uh, where, you know, uh, you can have linear dot arrays and you can have space for co-integration um, and, uh, and, and interconnects that would actually make scaling feasible. Um, we also have showed a simplified MOSFET design without explicit tunnel gates. And um, 
we uh, did some Zeeman spectroscopy in a single electron quantum dot. Okay, so that's that's uh, kind of what I had to talk about um, today, and I'll just acknowledge um, a lot of the people that have made this work possible. Um, so uh, Francois Figakis um, is a research professor in my group and really has spearheaded the gallium arsenide uh, work. And um, uh, my collaborators, Michael Reimer and Zbig Wazilewski, um, who work on the optics and the materials side, and uh, several students and postdocs who have contributed um, to these um, projects. And uh, these, are, these are some of the main people I've pictured here, but there's a longer list uh, of names written here. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and also thank you to our, our funding agencies and so forth. Okay, um, I think that's, that's everything I wanted to say. So I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you might have. So thanks, Jonathan. That was that was a very comprehensive, uh, detailed talk. And uh, so let's see, uh, you know, what uh, people may have to ask. So I think we can just, uh, you know, raise hands and ask questions as people deem fit. So are there any questions for Jonathan? And uh, yeah. Seems people are still absorbing the, the details of the talk. <laughs> Sorry, well, yeah, maybe it was uh, too dense, I don't know. <laughs> so the, the, the first part, which uh, dealt with the photon source, of course, you know, that is very interesting because, you know, we, uh, we personally have a lot of interest in photons and their applications, right? So sure. uh, the, sure. the thing that I kind of missed because, you know, there was a lot of uh, stuff going on. Um, what, would, what was the brightness of these sources? Like, you know, how many photons per second? Oh, okay, well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't say anything about that. And, and oh, that's really it. something that we haven't, um, I, I would say that we haven't really quantified that very well yet. Okay. Um, the, I mean, okay, if we just look at these sort of lateral, uh, PN junction. So yeah, you know, th this kind of spectra here that I'm showing here. Um, the, the efficiency is not very high when we, if we look at the PN current and we think about all the electrons and all the holes that are, that are um, flowing in the circuit, um, the number of photons that we're getting out is, is, is very low <laughs> compared to what you would expect if all the electrons and holes recombine. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I don't think that's necessarily intrinsic. I mean, I think that um, uh, when you're when you're you know sort of dealing with macroscopic currents, you have lots of different ways the current can flow and different sort of um, non-radiative processes that can happen. Uh, when we get down to really dealing with sort of uh, the few electron level and sort of single photon level, then I think uh, we'll be able to uh, properly characterize that. But but you know determining the intrinsic radiative recombination. Um, prob probability or efficiency is um, is really the key thing that, that we need to determine to to know whether this source can be sort of deterministic and on demand or whether it's just going to be kind of you know not very useful mm -hmm. because it would just be sort of one in a hundred times or something. Right, right, right. So thanks, Jonathan. So we have a couple of hands raised. So first is Anindo. Anindo, can you ask your question? Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for the nice talk. So uh, since I'm not uh, from this field, so. Uh, can I ask you, so is there a sense in which X naught and X minus can be associated with a spin, a uh, maybe a Lorentz spin or maybe a, so, some notion of spin? And uh, is there a notion of a spin charge separation in these uh, in these plots? OK, well, yeah, so I mean, I haven't really thought of it that I haven't, I haven't thought much about that. Um, so um, I mean, I would say that the um, the, the electron and hole have to have opposite spin to conserve angular momentum um, for, for, the, for the X naught. Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I, to be honest, I haven't uh, thought much about that because I'm, I'm not really the quantum optics person, right? So the, mm -hmm. <laughs> these measurements were done in my collaborator's lab, but uh, um, okay. yeah, sorry, I don't have a great answer for that uh, at okay, the moment, but um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, to sort of speak a little bit on those lines, though, um, what we're hoping for the photon source is that when we have the n equals two plateau on the single electron pump, so when we when we eject two electrons from the dot, um, there's a good chance that those would be ejected in a spin singlet, 
and then that spin singlet as it as it forms a biexciton and recombines with holes that entanglement would still be left and printed on the uh, two photons and the polarizations of the two photons. I see. So that that's something that we're hope so we're hoping to achieve an entangled photon source, not just a single photon source. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Home, uh, Professor Home, do you yeah, have? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. So thanks for the nice talk, but regarding the 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 point you made about on-demand electrically driven photon source towards the end of the first part of your talk, you mentioned about time-correlated pairs vis-a-vis -vis entangled photons and their right. possible applications. Now, what do, you mean, what do you really mean by time-correlated pairs and how the time correlation there is measured? I would like to know a bit more about that. Right, right. So, so I mean, you know, just to be clear, we haven't uh, we haven't done any measurements of time correlated pairs. I'm just sort of predicting that that could be um, that could be uh, a resource that we get from this kind of. Um, but what kind uh, of time correlation operationally you think of or you are envisaging? Means what, you, yeah, what well, you mean by time correlated pairs in the operational sense? Right, right. So, so all I mean there is that. Um, in every RF cycle, we could emit two electrons, and if both and and those electrons will generally come out of the dot, uh, there might there will be a little bit of jitter, but generally speaking, uh, the the two electrons would have a kind of a fixed uh, time delay between them. Um, Originating well, from their times of emission and fluctuations in their time. That's right. That's right. Yeah, times of emission from the quantum dot. Are going to. I mean, there, there'll be some fluctuation, but generally speaking, uh, they'll be within some narrow time window, mm -hmm. and then you have this process of um, relaxation down to the bottom of the conduction band, and then recombination with the hole. And so, within that time scale, you should get two photons, you know, quote unquote, at the same time, right? But but within that sort of um, uh, relaxation and recombination time scale. Also oh, within that relaxation time scale, you have yeah. that correlation. And you ultimately measure the correlations on the photons, on the sub right. properties of photon. Yeah, that's that's right. Also it is in that sense. So what advantage it could have compared to the other type of entangled photon source? Or is there any special virtue of this thing you envisage? Right, right. So um, again, I mean, this is not completely my area of expertise, but I know that um, people have looked at quantum illumination protocols where uh, rather than having genuine entanglement, you can exploit uh, time correlation. So, you know, if two, if two photons yeah, can it. be controllably emitted at the same time, yeah. you know, roughly the same time, mm -hmm. then you can use that time correlation to identify uh, a photon that that is sent to an object and reflected back. So oh, you sort of generate two photons. You keep one sort of in a loop, and you send one to an object. It comes back. Yeah. You use the you use the um, the one that you held back to kind of identify uh, the if you know the distance to the target, for example. Yeah, yes, yes. Then you could identify which photon was actually the one that you sent out, as opposed to just some background photon that's coming as noise. Okay. So this is what it's called. You use the term quantum. What is the application? Illumination. Of illumination. So it is in that context. It is this time correlation aspect would be important. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, Professor Hong, otherwise, this term okay. on demand, electrically driven. What is the significance? Means what is the special for the applicational point of view? Or could you please elaborate? Oh well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's my impression that it would be very desirable to have a, an all electrical source, like, like you don't have lasers or anything, and you know, you can just sort of send an electric, electrical signal, get a photon, you know, on demand with high probability. I, I don't, I don't think that that, that really exists today. I don't know, Urbashi, does that exist? <laughs> 
Well, it's the quantum dots, right? So then, of course, this is one uh, different way in which you are, uh, you know, trying to probe this problem. But then, these quantum dot systems do have these electrically driven dots. So they mm -hmm. uh, do. Uh, those are the ones which are supposed to be the on-demand photon sources, right? So, but then uh, this is a new uh, system that you are investigating, and uh, I, I'm sure you'll be comparing with uh, with uh, known ones because uh, the study. Mm -hmm. 2D systems, uh, there is a lot of promise, right, for on-demand sources. So uh, definitely electrically driven dots do exist, but then whether, you know, we will have better properties for this one, that is, of course, the research challenge that you have. And also uh, rate is important too, right? I mean, if you can Again, generate yeah. deterministically at a gigahertz, it's that much be better great. than if you can do it at one, 100 megahertz. Yeah, but then of course it depends on your application. So if you are actually interested in this photon uh, being a single photon, uh, uh, you know, really distinguishable single photon, then your G2 of 0.3 that you showed for some, from some other group, right? That would not yeah. be a, would not be a great G2 that we would. Oh, yeah, yeah. Have. No, no, I mean, they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, so I didn't, I don't want to like, some, you'll lose some, right? them, but that's not, yeah, it's not the greatest G2 in that uh, That we would have probably uh, seen. So if you can come up with a source where the G2 is, you know, at least 10 to the minus two or lower, and then it also has a brightness, which is in the gigahertz. That would be very interesting because then, you know, mm -hmm. you have the distinguishability, but at the same time, the brightness as well. Because as you go yeah. up in brightness, yeah. you compromise with the G2, uh, yeah. from what I understand exactly. at the moment. Yeah, yeah so all I, all I can say from our work is that we can mm -hmm. get a gigahertz in terms of the electrons from the mm -hmm. pump. But then um, you have to figure out the photons and, and as you Yeah, yeah, on, so right? we're hoping that translates to the photons too, but that remains to be seen. Right, right, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Professor Holm, is that? Uh, yes, yes, yes. OK. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so does anyone else have? Uh, is that Tarun? Uh, sorry. I... Hello. Hi, Ubuzi, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So Jonathan, my name is Tarun. Hi. And in fact, uh, uh, I'm from the middle of India. This place is in the and uh, I have been working on gas algas for last more than five years. Okay. That's more or less what, what you have been doing. Not, you know, a lot of overlap. And uh, uh, I may have a few questions. But uh, to begin with that, I think the question by Aninda, I probably missed it. Uh, can you go back to that slide? EL, EL slide on Gilemas night war? Uh, yeah, just one second. Yeah, this yeah, like, slide. yeah one, next, 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 next one, okay. next one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the question was whether this X zero and X minus could be correlated with the, you know, different spin uh, polarized electrons. That was the question. And in the, uh, why is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, so, usually so, these kind of, uh, I, I have this Luttinger liquid model in mind where you have spin charge separation. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering yeah, whether so these. Uh, uh, yeah, so the actually case. that is not the case. We we do work in spin photonics. In Gallimas yeah. night, uh, you have a spin degeneracy basically. So both let a spin up or a spin down, you will have the same energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it is it has nothing to do with that spin basically. They are exciton and there are different uh, ways like how you can form excitons. And anyway, uh, Jonathan presented a lot of things about, you know, Lots of types of excitons. So this is anyway one of the you know excitonic related feature, but uh, not no spin here basically. That's what I was. So say. you're saying that x x zero and x minus would uh, one should think of uh, of them as things that carry uh, zero Lorentz spin. So uh, so suppose I wanted to okay. decompose them in terms there is, of Lorentz. There is no there is see in Kalamas night uh, you have a spin degeneracy. Huh. So for experiment like this, you don't have energy difference uh, with respect to spin basically, okay? You have the same energy for a spin up or a spin down. What you could have like, you can have like, uh, you know, localized exciton or bound exciton or, you know, tri you know bi uh, trions or, you know, bi exciton or uh, uh, depending on your like, you know, how exciton is confined and all that. So you could have different things basically. There are many features that are associated with exciton. There is a lot of, you know, signature of that and, uh, but it has nothing to do with spin, basically. That's what I'm trying to tell you. 
Okay. I, I didn't for follow spin, that. I mean, for... X naught uh, is a particle. I mean, it's a quasi particle. So I can decompose that in terms of the irreducible representations of the Lorentz group. So uh, all that I'm okay. asking is that uh, there will be uh, all kinds of spins in, appearing in the right hand side of that uh, uh, decomposition. So and uh, there will be some uh, some some amplitude in front of uh, each of these spins. And the, 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 typically, what happens is that uh, it will be peaked in some uh, um, in some region. So the, it, there must be a mathematical description in that sense. Well, I mean, I mean, you have spin yeah. selection yeah. rules, yeah. right? I mean, because the photon has to carry one unit of angular momentum. Yeah, for example, yeah, for, uh, uh, that, that is also there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 for example, like uh, we do, um, we call them like inverse spin Hall effect measurement in our lab. In fact, uh, my one of my students is going to defend his thesis soon. So we uh, populate uh, um, quantum wells with spin up or spin down, depending on the polarization state of light. That's what we do. Okay, right. but right. let it be left or right uh, polarization, the energy is same basically. So you right. create either a spin up or spin down, but energy is same basically. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, okay. yep. unless you have a magnetic field, right? And you get a same yeah. spinning. Correct. Correct. This one. Okay, so, so essentially okay. you're saying so that anyway, x0 and x minus should be thought of as a particle carrying the same spin. Yes, it could be. Okay. So actually that information is not there in this in this graph basically. You cannot okay. drive any information related to a spin from this graph. That's what I'm trying to okay. tell you. You have okay. to do some right. you have to do like what we do, inverse spin hall effect or some other measurement, okay. then you will get that information basically. So right. Right. we do that in fact in our lab, but this graph is not related to that. Fine. Now, Jonathan, can you go to your next slide, please? Uh, this one? Ah, uh -huh, yes, that one. So, see, my question here is, uh, when you are, you know, you are applying bias, and you can do like whether uh, x0 is disappearing or x minus is disappearing. So, uh, you don't bring quantum confined star effect into picture here, because, you know, when you have electric field, that could change the energy also. So that you don't bring into discussion here. Quantum Sorry. confined stark stark effect QCS. Oh, 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 the quantum confined stark effect. Yes, yes, yeah. Right, right. So I okay. So yeah, we've started to look at that a little bit, but from what I recall, uh, we think that energy shift should be very small actually in our geometry. Okay. Yeah. So. Because you know we do that quite often, so and uh, we do a lot of like magneto hall, or in fact, uh, uh, we have a very specialized facility in our lab where we can do quantum hall, photoluminescence, and photoconductivity under the same configuration, basically down to 1.4 Kelvin. In fact, I would like to talk to you later. Probably we could do something together, and there is a lot of new things that we keep on doing in our samples by having that unique facility, which is I think very very unique. We got a lot of nice. Yeah, sure. I'd be, so, be, yeah. Be, be happy to talk more. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But, but I, I, think I, think I, would, I would say that the what we've identified here is the x naught and x minus peaks that may not be the right assignment. But what we've it, th those peaks don't shift very much themselves with the um, with the the top gate voltage. But but yeah. here what we're changing is the relative strength of the peaks. And I should yeah. say that this is not we can't do this in every sample. We've just noticed this in a few samples and we're still trying to understand, you know, um, exactly what's going on there. Yeah. <laughs> this is very preliminary, yeah. Yeah. And uh, another thing, uh, I think, uh, fine, that is okay. Yeah, by the way, uh, see, when I was looking at your, uh, this uh, Gallimas night quantum dot, so you talked about gaps. So that's why I, I think around three micron gap, that's what you were talking in little geometry, three micron right. gap. Yeah. And then you have a two dag basically. So, uh, but for a quantum dot, three micron is too, too large. So how do you get quantum confined, you know, from- Oh, no, no, sorry. Dot. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for yeah. the, the, the quantum dot is, is much smaller than that, right? I mean, the, the quantum dot is kind of on the scale of a, a few hundred nanometers. Um, okay. The three micron is the gap between the p and the n side and in, in the p n junction that that we okay. studied. Yeah. So so okay. the idea would be that the the electron pump, the quantum dot, would be on the n side, just on the edge, and then you would have some okay. gap, and then you'd have a p side. And the oh, electrons do move pretty ballistically through the system. So you know, you know, moving you know by a micron or something is is you can do that without much scattering. 
Okay. So in fact, like uh, electroluminescence that was around A20. So that is, you also mentioned this gallium arsenide bulk energy. So right. in electroluminescence, there is no quantum mechanical shift basically. So that's what uh, I was uh, seeing. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends on if we look at um, the uh, single header interface or the quantum well. So when we look at the quantum well, we do get, um, we do see that the energy uh, uh, correlates with the width of the quantum well, just the way you would expect. Yeah. Okay. But so it, Tarun. Like, Any further questions, then we can uh, uh, entertain that. Otherwise, we can, you know, formally uh, end the, the seminar and, and with thanking Jonathan uh, once again. So I think, uh, I think, yeah, I think there aren't any further yeah, questions. It, so it, it, thanks it, a lot. It was uh, an so, excellent talk. It was an excellent talk. Let me say that. Well, very good. Thank talk. you very much. Yeah. And, and thank yeah, you. Thank you so much.